Thank you. The uh, next, the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 4013 in the name of Sue Webber on economic value of medical charity research in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Sue Webber to open the debate up to seven minutes, please, Ms Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm really pleased to be able to bring forward my first uh, member's business debate on such an important topic to Scotland. Uh, cardiovascular health has always interested me, and of course this becomes more relevant when it relates to you personally. In my pre-parliamentary career, I worked closely with medical and surgical professionals in university teaching hospitals across the UK. One of the first surgeries I observed was open heart surgery in the Western Infirmary in Glasgow. The surgeon was Mr Alan Kirk, a young, dynamic surgeon that was looking to adapt his practice to do beating heart surgery rather than on-pump bypasses, with the associated risks that come with that. Much has changed surgically since then, not least the closure of the Western and the establishment of the West of Scotland Regional Heart and Lung Centre at the Golden Jubilee. And perhaps the canny amongst you in the Chamber might recognise his name. Mr Kirk was in Parliament last week and he is a pioneer of robotic thoracic surgery, along with his colleague John Butler. We need clinicians like this to adopt new, innovative techniques that benefit patients and improve outcomes. My dad was one of those that benefited from innovation. When he was told that he needed cardiac surgery, I know the look on my face told my mum and dad just how serious things were. I silently wanted to know that he would get an off-pump bypass. I did not want his heart to stop beating. He did. He successfully had his cabbage, and nearly 10 years on, he has not looked back. So thank you to the team at NHS Lothian. And before all of that comes years of research, of investment, and blood, sweat and tears from those carrying out the research. Funding for clinical research in Scotland through the Chief Scientist's Office has remained stagnant for several years. When investment in clinical research is compared on a per capita basis between the UK and Scotland, Scotland's investment equates to £12.79 per capita, as opposed to the £20.55 per capita spend in England. The British Heart Foundation believes that the Scottish Government should increase funding to the Chief Scientist's Office, in line with the per capita funding of the National Institute for Healthcare Research by the UK Government. And if the Scottish Government were to utilise consequentials and its own budget to match per capita the planned NIHR increases to £2 billion, it could transform clinical research in Scotland, securing it again as a world leader in medical research and bringing new and improved treatments and care to Scotland first. It could also generate as much as £257 million for the economy every year and support 6,000 jobs across Scotland. And there are indirect and direct benefits on the NHS too. For example, troponin tests are used to test whether an individual has had a heart attack on admission to A&E. The High Stayaxe trial, led by Professor Nichols Mills, who is a BHF Professor of Cardiology at the Centre for Cardiovascular Science at the University of Edinburgh, looked at the use of a higher sensitivity trophophen test than was previously used. The reduction in time in hospital and the 50% increase in discharge as a result of this new sensitive test has the potential to create huge cost savings for the NHS and a reduction in bed demand at a time when the NHS is under significant pressure. Clinical studies like this, undertaken in Scotland, are crucial to improving patient care and reducing inequalities in care. Investment in this research clearly has the potential to support the Scottish budget through reducing overall costs in the NHS. Other charities are also raising similar concerns, as well as pointing out the benefits of increased investment. Stroke is Scotland's leading cause of disability. Around 10,000 people every year will have a stroke and there are 128,000 people living with the effects of a stroke in Scotland. 
The Stroke Association are the only exclusively stroke research funder in Scotland with a current portfolio of 3.5 million. Investing in stroke research can generate savings, savings for health and social care, as well as improving quality of life for stroke survivors and their families. Research investment per stroke is only £48 in the UK per year, in comparison to 241 per cancer patient and 118 per dementia patient. For a condition that generates such a sizeable economic burden in Scotland, this requires greater priority in research funding and support. Cancer Research UK is the largest independent funder of cancer research in the world. And in 2020-21, Cancer, Cancer Research UK spent £421 million on new and ongoing research into prevention, diagnosis and treatment in the UK. They have also supported research into over 200 types of cancer, with long-term investment helping create a thriving network of research in 90 laboratories and institutions across the UK and supporting the work of over 4,000 scientists, doctors and nurses. Cancer Research UK has spent over £188 million on research funding in Scotland over the past five years, across seven universities, and currently funds 100 PhD students, amongst other things. It is not just direct health benefits that come from medical research. There are also the economic benefits that come because of this type of work. Benefits to both the Scottish economy and every individual that is impacted by the research. Not every project will result in a miracle cure, a wonder drug or a new approach. However, I think we can all agree that research saves lives. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Thank you, Ms Weber. And I now call uh, Paul McLennan to be followed by Tess White. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, just to mention that I may have to go. I've got a chain across party group at half past six, so I may have to leave before the, the summing up from the Minister. Um, can I thank Sue Weber for bringing forward this debate tonight? Sue and I, along with visit others, visited the British Heart Foundation Research Centre near the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary a, a few months ago. Uh, we were shown around the facility and shown the research that goes on, mm -hmm. uh, and Sue's touched on that within the institution. Uh, we spoke to medical students and doctors who benefit from the funding. It, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating, and made us all aware of the amazing unseen work that is carried out by the British Heart Foundation and other charities day in, day out. In East Lothian, around 11,000 people are living with heart and circulatory diseases. Around 12,000 people have been diagnosed with high blood pressure. Around 27% of adults have obesity in East Lothian and 16% of adults smoke. Nationally, 30 babies a month are diagnosed with con congenital heart defect in Scotland. Around 700,000 people are living with heart and circulatory diseases in Scotland. And, and, and the most frightening statistic is that every 50 minutes in Scotland, someone is admitted to hospital due to a heart attack, so we can see the benefits of the research. Heart and circulatory diseases kill three in ten people in Scotland. Now, I recently visited the British Heart Foundation shop in North Berwick and was very warmly welcomed and was very impressed by the setup. The BHF is the largest charity retailer in both Scotland and the UK. And the British Heart Foundation is an important contributor to the circular economy and a sustainable Scotland. So the British Heart Foundation has the support of 1,400 volunteers that allow their 75 shops across Scotland to raise money for life-saving research. They also support the Scottish Government's proposal to ban the destruction of unsold goods. They believe in reducing waste as much as possible by recycling the nations that they can't sell. They are working towards a goal of zero avoidable waste by 2030. They also sell an average of 1,500 tonnes of what they call pre-loved clothes across their 75 uh, charity shops. They resell 18,000 sofas every year. So they currently fund £60 million of life-saving research in Scotland, and this is largely due to the sale of donated goods. This research funding also creates additional benefits for the economy in Scotland. Research by the Fraser of Orlando Institute and the Valley of Medical Charity Research Funding in Scotland suggested that funding from BHS, uh, BHF creates £80 million in GVA and supports 1,860 jobs across the country. In February, the uh, Institute uh, of uh, the, of, uh, 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 the University of Strathclyde published analysis on the contribution of medical research funding by charities to the Scottish economy. Their modelling found that in 2019, research funding by charity supported 7,500 jobs, £470 million output, and £320 million GBA in Scotland. Charity retailers provide over 25,500 jobs in the UK, alongside 233,000 volunteer opportunities. The British Heart Foundation welcomed the increase in NIHR funding from the Scottish Government to £78.4 million. 
The UK Government in the 2021 Autumn Statement committed to increasing the NIHR budget to £2 billion by 2024 25 the BHF uh, are asking the Scottish Government to commit to ring fencing any consequential uh, funding brought to Scotland from the planned uplift uh, for the NHIR by the UK Government to £2 billion by 2024 25 Government funding of medical research follows similar patterns to medical research charities, with much of the funding supporting work in universities and NHS that we talked about. This funding supports the creation of highly skilled professionals who are significant economic contributors in the region. If the, government, the Scottish Government were to commit to NHR funding uplift, it has the potential to generate £56.4 billion a million to the Scottish economy every year and support over 1,100 jobs. With continuing investment, Scotland can attract more talented researchers and create greater stability to those seeking to build a clinical research career in Scotland. The pandemic reduced the levels of funding from charities and other funders which have traditionally supported clinical research careers. Career funding is crucial in allowing healthcare professionals to develop the skills to undertake research in NHS. We can attract these highly skilled professionals to Scotland, bring them with them the research skills and increase NHS Scotland's clinical capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Tess White to be followed by Michael Mara. Up to four minutes, please, Ms White. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As Volunteers Week 2022 comes to an end, I'd like to thank my colleague Sue Webber for securing the time for this afternoon's debate. It is an important topic and a fitting tribute to the fundraising efforts of thousands of volunteers in the North East and across Scotland who helped to raise money for potentially life-saving medical research. The funding contribution that charities make to medical research is startling. Without it, the Fraser of Allender Institute estimates that the government would need to increase direct funding by 73% to cover the shortfall. The work of these organisations and others like them has brought hope to thousands of people who face life-limiting conditions and illnesses. Cancer Research UK supports pioneering research into more than 200 types of cancer. Its contribution to the medical research base should not be underestimated. Over the past 40 years, cancer survival has doubled in the UK. Meanwhile, the British Heart Foundation has invested £50 million in more than 100 projects in Scotland, researching heart and circulatory disease. In my own region, the BHF funds two PhD, PhD studentships, 10 other research staff at the University of Aberdeen. Led by Professor Dana Dawson, researchers in the Granite City are carrying out the first national study into broken heart syndrome, a potentially fatal heart condition experienced by thousands of people the length and breadth of the UK. At the University of Dundee, where the BHF supports seven research staff, researchers have been running a treatment trial into high blood pressure. The reality, however, is that these organisations, like so many others, have been hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. At the height of the pandemic, medical research expenditure by charities fell by around 44% as retail trading came to a halt and household budgets faced significant uncertainty. While the UK has largely returned to business as usual as COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted, concerns remain about the future investments in medical research. We've already seen a significant reduction in research spend from the Association of Medical Research Charities for 2021 and 2022, amounting to around £150 million. The BHF reports that it will take three or more years before charity research spend returns to pre-pandemic levels. This has implications not just for Scotland's health research and development, but our economy as well. The third sector medical research not only helps to improve health outcomes for the population, it contributes to job creation, technological innovation and national infrastructure, and it helps to develop Scotland's skills pipeline. Moreover, the Fraser of Allender Institute found that a pound spent by medical research funding by charities has a significantly larger impact than the average pound spent in Scotland. As the Scottish Government looks at the levers it can pull to build a strong economy, I would urge it to think holistically 
about the value the third sector medical research can add to the Scottish economy and society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. And I call Michael Mara uh, to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate and give my thanks to Sue Webber for bringing it to the Chamber, as well as to the British Heart Foundation for commissioning the research from the Fraser of Allender Institute. The conclusions of that research have been rehearsed in part already on, around the economic impact of medical research in Scotland, particularly that funded by charities, but has been uh, rehearsed indeed over many years in Scotland um, in a variety of publications. Uh, there, it stresses how important medical and the broader scientific research uh, institutes and uh, work goes on at our universities is to our communities and also to our country's future. And there is no picture drawn of a successful future Scotland that does not have research excellence right at its centre. So the conclusions of the report that we have um, that we are talking about tonight only add to a wealth of data and policy documents dating back to the start of devolution uh, that come to the same conclusion. I have to say the importance of university research and innovation to my home city of Dundee cannot be overstated. And the performance, I want to note this, of the University of Dundee School of Life Sciences is of truly global significance. Uh, in the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, published only in the last couple of weeks, they came out as the top university in the whole of the UK for biological sciences, bar none. Um, but I wish I could say that the debate was timely. Uh, it makes calls on government that perhaps would have been perhaps a, a little bit better heard prior to the recent uh, re 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 resource spending review, which turns out was neither a real spending review nor, as we have heard continuously, a budget. Because the result seems to me to be a little more than an appetiser for Andrew Wilson's Growth Commission austerity. If it is anything, that report, that spending review, it is an expression of priorities. And I am afraid that education and research, as we are talking tonight, is not among them. And that is confusing for some of us, because education used to be the sacred cause. It was once the defining mission, and it was only a matter of weeks ago central to the supposed economic transformation strategy. Instead, we've got 8 per cent real-term cuts for higher education, and we've got a globally competitive sector that has to work to attract talent, external investment, partnerships and student recruitment, badly suffering as a result of a lack of leadership and prioritisation by this government. But specific to the research, we have an outstanding set of REF results in Scotland, where improved performance against the previous comparator seven years ago is being rewarded by cuts to budgets. Take the University of Aberdeen in my region, a £2 million cut to the Research Excellence Grant. That's a 10 per cent cut, the absolute cap of what was permitted, um, and more expected to come, more cuts expected to come in 2023-24. That's not investing for the future. It is punishing successes of the past. So the debate before us is a request of government, in actual fact, to step in when the unexpected happens. When the pandemic, pandemic hit, the resource coming from charity shops and donations, as people have highlighted already, dried up. That is what government should do, be, should do. It should be there when the rain falls. It should help to bridge an unexpected gap. But what is unforgivable is when government sees the trends, when it actually creates the trends. So our research leadership in the UK is slipping. There's no doubt about that. And it's happened over a period of years and years. The REF results that I've talked about already showed us just a couple of weeks ago that eight of our top 10 performers actually improved at a slower rate than the rest of UK comparator universities. And on the same day that the Scottish Government published its resource spending review, the UKRI, which is the UK Wide Research Council, published multi-year research funding for universities in England. Research funding for English universities is going up by 31.7 per cent over the three-year period from 2022-23 to 2024-25. That is the direct local competition that our universities must meet. Scottish and English universities compete for research grants using their core funding as the basis to do so, presiding officer. The playing field is deeply uneven, and we can only predict that Scotland's share of competitive, competitively won research funding from UKRI will continue to slide from 15.4 per cent a few years ago to 12.9 per cent as it is now, and further down again as the years to come. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, this is a question of leadership and choices, and choices that leaders make. The British Heart Foundation are right to highlight and remind us that our strengths, what our strengths are, but how precarious that position is if government chooses to ignore these realities. 
Thank you, Mr. Mara. And I now call Stephanie Callaghan, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond to the debate. Up to four minutes, please, Ms. Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Sue Weber for bringing this topical debate to the Chamber too. The pandemic has certainly brought our attention to the importance of medical research for our health and wellbeing. And in Scotland, the life sciences community really did mobilise and respond rapidly to the challenges that were arising from COVID-19. From research, drug discovery and manufacturing to clinical trials for our vaccines too. Scotland is considered a world leader in medical research and we must continue this proud legacy across the private, public and charity sectors. The health benefits are really clear and medical research continues to develop and make life-changing differences to patients. Importantly, research provides hope for the future for so many people who are living with long-term conditions that there will be less pain, they will get better treatments and they will have a little bit more control over their lives. Now, the focus of today's motion is research charities and charities really are in a unique position to leverage the power of grass grassroots movements too. Generous public donations and specialist expertise from the industry can be complementary and drawing in the lived experience of patients and families is key. Um, Paul McLean mentioned earlier on as well about how the British Heart Foundation raised so much funds through, through their stores. Um, and he brought to mind a wee meeting I had as well uh, with a young man called Mohammed, who won an award for his volunteering, a refugee uh, who had come to this country and decided to volunteer at the British Heart Foundation and is hoping to be a doctor in the future as well. That was a couple of years ago now. But just so much warmth and so much dedication, it helped him to learn the language. And there's lots of little ripples that come out from these charities as well that make a real, real difference moving forward to our communities. The economic value of medical charity research in Scotland is really, really clear, but it's not without its challenges as well. And as the motion highlights, medical charity research in Scotland supports a lot of local jobs and generates wider investment too. Supporting direct employment at universities and in medical industries but also with that spillover effect that supports a wide variety of jobs right across Scotland too. Many of these jobs are, are highly skilled and well-paid positions within world-leading um, institutions. The medical research sector is one of the most effective in Scotland at driving economic growth and employment, and it really has attracted talent from all over the globe. However, there are quite serious issues that are facing research charities in 2022, and not least the pandemic has put enormous financial pressure on individuals and on organisations too. This isn't something that's going away any time soon, with the current cost of, cost of living crisis looking set to worsen. So medical research funding by charities is estimated at around 46% of all third sector and public funding, making this income integral to Scotland's medical research industry. Long-term consequences of charity funding reductions in Scotland are likely to include shortages of highly skilled medical researchers, stagnation in treatment development, and there is the potential to neg negatively impact Scotland's reputation as a world leader in research. In response, we have had some charities calling on the Scottish Government to increase investment in third sector medical research by a further £37 million. However, Scotland does not have the same borrowing powers as Westminster. So, making a comparison between the UK Government's spending per head of population of England with that of Scotland seems a wee bit unfair to me, given that the Scottish Government's hands are tied, fiscally speaking. Where would this additional investment come from, really is the question. And the Scottish Government are already doing so much to mitigate against some of the damaging policies that have come out in Westminster, including the best bedroom tax and looking to increase child support. But when we do not have the freedom to borrow and make long-term investments in our people's health and wellbeing, our economic options remain limited. I think we really need to listen to charities and understand the challenges they are facing and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to support their ambitious work and ensuring that Scotland remains a world leader in research and development. And the Scottish Government, within its budget, has demonstrated already that its commitment to ensuring researchers have access to the infrastructure, the training and the career development opportunities that they need to succeed and work with partners too. The work to create an attractive environment for students to carry out their research is ongoing, and I agree that we must work collaboratively with the medical research charity sector moving forward. But in reality, it is only with the power of independence that Scotland is going to be able to properly address the challenges ahead. And we need that to happen to enhance our economy and improve our nation's health. Thanks. 
Thank you, Ms Callaghan. And I now call on Ivan McKee to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I would like to begin by congratulating Sue Webber on having uh, this member's debate tabled and to thank those members who have contributed to the discussion on this very important topic. The Scottish Government recognises the important impact that the medical research charity sector has on the wider economy, particularly across the life sciences sector. And by investing in growing our own company base and attracting new companies, we are building a community. We want Scotland to grow as a place for true innovation and the research undertaken here to make a real difference to our own and global health challenges. Scotland has a thriving life science community recognised for the distinctive capabilities of its business base and research institutions, international reputation and potential for significant growth and creation of high-value jobs. In 2019, turnover in the sector stood at £7.4 billion, with gross value added at £3.1 billion, employing nearly 42,000 people and over 700 enterprises and higher education institutions. The health and life sciences sector in Scotland is supported by a highly skilled workforce operating in a diverse range of functions, including R&D roles within a range of research operations. We continue to invest in our future workforce, recognising the critical role of the development of scientific and commercial skills, sustaining our economic recovery and contributing to future growth. In terms of boosting innovation, we will be updating the Scottish Government's innovation strategy this year. This will provide an opportunity to build on the National Strategy for Economic Transformation and other recent work, such as the Muscatelli Report, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board Report on Innovation and the UK Government's Innovation Strategy. The Scottish Health Industry Partnership is working in collaboration with AstraZeneca, Roche and the Digital Health and Care Innovation Centre to develop the Opera Heart Failure Service. Um, this aims to create a streamlined digital service that can effectively address diagnosis backlogs and reduced waiting times for echocardiograms in the Glasgow area while demonstrating new artificial intelligence technology in the heart failure diagnosis pathway. Heart failure accounts for 1 to 2 per cent of healthcare spending in developed countries and 52 per cent of patients die within five years of diagnosis and heart failure prevalence is predicted to rise by 46 per cent over the next eight years. Scotland's world-class university research and its key outputs of new knowledge and insights are fundamental to economic recovery and growth. And the baseline grants for university research and innovation from the Scottish Government via the Scottish Funding Council for 2022-23 was increased by £4.7 million to almost £300 million to maintain and strengthen Scotland's excellent research base. The impact of research outputs from Scotland's universities has been maximised through increasing linkages into the wider innovation ecosystem, including partnerships with businesses, charities and NHS Scotland. Michael Mara. The Minister of Given Way, did you not recognise that that allocation from the Scottish Funding Council is actually resulting in cash cuts? in terms of to the uh, amount of money uh, coming to universities, many of whom have improved their performance over the last seven years rather than declining. So successes are being rewarded with cuts from this government. Surely that 31.7 per cent increase from UK uh, research in England is a wake-up call to this government about what it must do to make our sector competitive. Minister. Uh, the sector in Scotland is hugely competitive. We attract far more than our share of research spending across our universities uh, and even in, in terms of uh, charity spending. Um, that is uh, significantly higher than it is across the rest of the UK, and the Scottish Government continues to recognise that and to support the research base and the sector. Um, and as well as addressing national challenges and creating a highly educated society, our investment in research is helping us to reach the economic, societal and environmental aims of Scotland's national performance framework and the sustainable development goals. And over the past two years, health research has been in the news like never before, and I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all those who have contributed to Scotland's research response to COVID-19, including colleagues from the third sector, universities and the NHS. And I would also like to thank uh, the people of Scotland for their extraordinary level of involvement. In 2021, over 20,000 people were recruited into COVID-19 clinical studies in Scotland. And these studies include the SIREN study that provided key early data on whether prior infection with COVID-19 protected against future infection and the genomic study that is generating data on the genes that influence people's susceptibility to particular infections. Scotland has also been fully involved in clinical trials of COVID-19 vaccines, with the first pa uh, patient globally in the Janssen vaccine trial being recruited in Dundee. 
As part of the research response to the pandemic, we also launched two COVID-19 research funding calls through the Chief Scientist Office. The rapid research and COVID-19 programme saw 56 individual projects funded with a total investment of £5 million. And as awareness of the longer-term effects of COVID-19 infection began to emerge, a second call was launched for research on key aspects of long COVID. And from this call, nine projects were funded. The research funded through these calls is continuing to inform the clinical relevant knowledge base around COVID-19. An example is the cardiac imaging and SARS coronavirus disease 19 study led by Professor Colin Berry from the University of Glasgow and funded as part of the rapid research on COVID-19 call. This study is following patients in real time after hospitalisation with COVID-19 and uses a number of medical assessments to understand more about patients' health, including scans of heart, kidneys and lungs. Blood tests to measure both inflammation and blood clotting over the short and medium term, and a series of quality of life questionnaires. The first round of results from this study were published recently in the prestigious journal Nature Medicine. Looking forward, the CSO recently announced the outcome of its Precision Medicines Alliance Scotland funding call, and this is almost £10 million invested in four NHS led research projects that will accelerate the development and delivery of precision medicine based approaches to tackle health conditions of major importance in Scotland, including diseases that disproportionately impact those at risk of socio economic disadvantage. This investment adds to the strong precision medicine ecosystem in Scotland that includes the Precision Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre and the Glasgow Precision Medicine Living Laboratory. To finish, President Officer, I would like to congratulate both the British Heart Foundation Scotland and Fraser of Allender Institute on the publication of their respective reports. The Scottish Government looks forward to continue to work with third sector organisations, including the BHF Scotland, to build on our strong research and innovation base for the benefit of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.